Now we have, uh, we have the last round table on, on, on the called the, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly Future with Leo Drollas. Please, if you would like to, to come up, Leo. Leo Drollas, Emanuele Grimaldi, please, if you would like to take place. Panos Lascaridis, John Liras, and the Director of Legal and External Affairs of IMO, Frederick Kenney, who is his first appearance with us. The Moderators will be, again, uh, David and Terry. And um, I ask them also to, to join us. The, please. Very athletic. And I will stay with you for this last panel because after this we will have this short um, chat about uh, Professor Francesco Berlingieri with Giorgio Berlingieri and Tom Birch Richardson. Thank you. <coughs> um, thanks very much and welcome again to, which is a kind of follow-on from the new fuels, new technology, old challenges session that we had this morning. But it's mainly some uh, newer panel members um, who were on earlier, distinguished ship owners. And, um, but this, as Francesco said, we've got the advantage of um, Frederick Kenny here with us. Uh, Frederick is a Director of Legal and External Affairs at the International Maritime Organization. He was before that um, a Judge Advocate General and Chief Counsel to the U.S. Coast Guard. So that means he, well, he held the title of Rear Admiral. But even more interesting and amusing and inspiring than that, he worked on um, icebreakers in, in polar regions and was telling me a hair-raising story about uh, being stuck in the ice and having to abandon ship. So um, we're really, really um, pleased to have him here. And obviously in his um, <clears throat> position at the IMO is the, the vital international regulatory authority, vital player in this whole debate, as we heard this morning from Lorenzo saying please, we just need proper rules. Well, the IMO is the rule maker, so, um, or one of the rule makers, so um, it'll be good to hear from that, from them. Um, so, perhaps just to start, um, I wondered, actually, if I could ask you, Frederick, uh, we, we latterly this morning talked about the, that it's not just a shipping industry issue, how to deal with pollution. It is going to be costly. Everybody is going to have to pay the price. And yet, the public seem, if at all possible, not to want to really wake up to the realities of, of paying more and being the, the price of being green. Do you have any feelings yourself about where we are with that debate, whether there's something the shipping industry itself can do? And secondly, where do you feel your um, ship owner panel around you is in terms of really accepting that they've got to act, or are they still a little bit in denial? That doesn't seem to be working. Hello. Well, thank you very much, Terry, and it's really a pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of the Secretary General and, 
and uh, the rest of the IMO. Uh, really a two-part question. The first one, with respect to uh, whether the shipping industry is in a state of denial, I would say that there's been a pretty significant change in that regard uh, just over the last four or five months. The, the focus and the message that we have been trying to communicate at the IMO is that the focus now with the challenges that are coming in 2020, uh, not just with the, the sulfur cap, but poten the potential carriage ban that will get voted on in 10 days at the Marine Environment Protection Committee and also the full implementation of the Ballast Water Convention, the focus really has to be on implementation. And I think we're seeing people accepting that that has to be the focus. Certainly the, the date of January 1st, 2020 for the sulfur cap is not going to change. It's procedurally impossible. Uh, and it's a fact that the shipping industry will need to comply on January 1st. Uh, there will be enforcement. I mean, I think there will be realistic enforcement. The IMO guidelines on port state control ask that port state control officers use their professional judgment and discretion in evaluating cases. Uh, and there will be lessons learned as all of these rules come into full effect and are implemented and that feedback will come back to the IMO uh, and examined. So I think that, uh, I, I don't think the industry is in a state of denial. I think everyone is really focused on implementation as is the IMO and that's where it should be. Uh, with respect to the general public, I think one of the issues that I've seen uh, is that I think shipping has a little bit of an identity crisis. When you compare the shipping industry with the aviation industry, for example, and you look at what ICAO has done uh, in terms of steps for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from airplanes, and compare that to what has already been done at the IMO and will be done with the enactment of the, strat the initial strategy for GHG reductions, I won't do the comparison for you, you can do it, but you can see that there's, there's very different steps that have been taken. But then if you look at the way it's been communicated in the media and really general public awareness, there's a significant gap there. And I, I personally think that part of that is because the aviation industry is a passenger focused industry and they have a very large, very well functioning marketing and communications regime where really the only segment of the shipping industry that has that is the cruise industry. And I think there has been a historic kind of cultural bias for shipping to remain quiet. And I, I think we need to look at that to see whether that is viable with the challenges that are facing shipping in the world and shipping is going to deliver when you look at the the sustainable development goals for 2030, shipping is going to deliver on those goals. And if we are going to have a sustainable future, it's going to be shipping that gets us that. But how many people in the public know that and what can we do to better communicate that to the public and get them on shipping side? I'll leave it at that. Okay, so that, that, that's um, an interesting response. Perhaps the other members of the panel very briefly could just respond as well. Where do, where do you think we are, particularly in reference to that second issue of is there something more we could do? Is greening shipping actually the great opportunity that, that the industry has been looking for in the sense that there has been an image problem for a long time and could this be an opportunity to, to, to rebuild a new shipping brand around green industry. John. Well, I think that um, Hugo Salerno said something in the previous session which is important, and, and that is that we have, um, if, if you like, different treatment in different industries on these issues of uh, the environment. And also, we have different alternatives in the different industries. So, one thing that, um, before I get to the image issue of shipping, I, I'd like to say this, that we are faced with a, with a situation as ship owners, which is not the case 
with the, um, for instance, car owners or with people who um, buy vehicles, if you like, in other industries. Um, it's the car manufacturer that's responsible for the emissions of the uh, cars, and it's the car manufacturer that has to be regulated. And um, the car manufacturer, or rather the, um, the uh, owner of the vehicle, usually, because it's a private person, is not in the hands like we are in shipping, at least in bulk shipping, of a charterer who is not party to these discussions at the IMO at the moment and has never been, either on the sulfur or on the uh, CO2 issues. And in the bulk sector, which is 82% of ton miles and is the transportation of staples for every country in the world, not just the developing countries, which need them most, maybe, but also for any nation that doesn't have them. So we're in an industry that is transporting staple goods, cargo shipping, I mean, and most of cargo shipping, the bulk shipping business, is, as I say, essential goods. So why is it that in our industry, it is not the refiners, it is not the shipbuilders, it is not the engine builders, but it's the ship owners who have to be regulated and have to be criticized because they haven't moved or they aren't moving or they're moving too late, etc., etc. So one, one issue I think that is important here is that there has to be a realization that in our business, except for the cruise industry, as was mentioned, which deals with passengers, and the ferry industry, which also deals with passengers, and maybe with some short sea shipping where people have a perception of what this transportation is about, the majority of transportation is shipping is in essential goods that we can't do without on this planet, and it's invisible. People don't um, have a perception of how a tanker operates, how a bulk carrier operates. What is the modus operandi? What is this Trump shipping model? So that is something that it's not easy for the industry itself to communicate. I've said this before at conference. Everybody says that you've got yourselves to blame. Why aren't you doing this? You know, the airline industry, as was stated, there are five alliances that cover 80% of the sort of air miles in this world. Everybody knows what an airplane is like. Everybody loves flying. And therefore, you know, they can, um, if you like, I'm sorry to say this, but to a very large extent, spin. And people are prepared to believe it because they don't want airline tickets to go sky high and suddenly not be able to fly, etc., etc. And in our industry, we can't spin. We haven't been negative. We have been telling people as what's, as what, what's possible and what isn't possible. And even though we are penalized because we are not the manufacturers of the ship, and we're not, in, 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 in a lot, to a large extent, the people who take the decisions about the operation, because we're in the hands of our charters, we are still willing to do whatever is necessary, provided the technology is available, and it's available generally, and the rules, as was stated many times in the previous session, are the same for everybody so that not some parts of the fleet or some nations are penalized, uh, whereas others are not. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to actually break in there and just ask Frank that, uh, Frederick, sorry, that question. Why does the IMO concentrate on ship owners? What is the responsibility of, of, oil, of fuel providers? What is the responsibility of charterers, shippers? Why are they off the hook for all this? Well, I think, uh, I don't know that off the hook is the right way to frame it. I think, uh, of course, the member states decide what decisions are going to be made at the IMO. Uh, I think there has been a historic reluctance at the IMO to regulate ashore. Certainly during the Marine Environment Protection Committee meetings that led up uh, to the decision to retain January 1st, 2020, as the date for the sulfur cap implementation, which actually was enacted in 2008. But in those discussions, there was some talk of, could the IMO regulate up the supply chain and regulate fuel uh, bunker suppliers? And that was ultimately rejected, but I think that's a cultural thing, because if you look at the history of the IMO, and we are celebrating our 70th anniversary this year, but if you look at the history, there have actually been very few times where the 
where the IMO is regulated ashore. The ISPS code is one example. The FAL convention is another, but, and reception facilities in Marpole is another, but those are fairly few and far between. So I think there would have to be that historic bias would need to be overcome. Okay. Um, Leo, do you want to make a comment as the mic comes through, or do you want to pass it on to? Pass, okay. Panos. Uh, thank you, Terry. I'd like to make a very few quick comments on the discussion on the previous panel, um, on which I felt sometimes like jumping from my chair. Well, first of all, I think the panel got it wrong when it spoke of 50% reduction by the year 2050. Uh, this is not correct. It's 50% by, by the year 2050 based on the emissions of 2008. And if you assume a growth rate of even 2% per year, then that means that by the year 2050, we will be talking about a reduction of perhaps 25 to 30% on the total emissions. Secondly, we hear a lot about, we heard a lot from the side of the oil industry about being able and willing to provide 0.5 fuel. But they didn't tell us on what specifications. There are no specifications yet for this fuel, we know this. The ICE organization have said that the earliest they can produce some specifications is 2020. Taking into account the myriads of problems we have even today with today's fuels, I think everybody must realize that there are real concerns about these fuels, their quality, their safety, their compliance with both MARPOL and SOLAS, and these are things which are not given today. No, uh, the, the, the oil producers do not talk about these things. Secondly, to add insult to injury, they are telling us, oh, we will supply you with 0.5 fuel, but after that, once the fuel is on board your ships, you are responsible for whatever happens. We will not take any responsibility. This is also unheard of. Uh, this this um, stems from recent communications of Okimf and other sources from the oil industry. I was also surprised that no one spoke about slow speed. Um, you know, we had uh, engine manufacturers, we, had, we have shipbuilders, but you know, the savings and the reductions we can have from engines and propellers and hull forms and production methods, these are all at their end. Nothing more can be expected, maybe 1%, 2%, 3%, but no more. This science is at its end now, it, 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 it is at its limits. On the contrary, by speed reduction, with a 20% speed reduction, you almost gain a 50% reduction in emissions. And if some countries and some fleets and some businessmen wish to do a business with double the speed of others, then this is their choice, but they cannot make the business have their own cake and eat it and not participate okay. in the emissions cut. So they have to contribute much more than a ship which does half the speed. And finally, the last thing is, uh, LNG, I think this is something that is not going to gain traction. It's not getting us anywhere by way of CO2 emissions. It will take care of the SOx and NOx gases in particular matter, but it can never meet any of the targets we have today. Finally, on our friend Mr. Salerno and Ajax and the classification societies, we don't see, see them coming out by strong statements trying to explain to the world what is feasible today and what it is not. One day they side with the yards, the next side with the regulators, the next day with the politicians, but they do all this without coming out clearly and unequivocally on the side of their masters, which are the ship owners. They are the ship owners' technical advisors. They should tell us and the world what is feasible and what is not feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Panos. Emmanuel. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the first question were, is where we are. The emissions of uh, the shipping sector, of the seaborne trade, is about 2% of the world emission. This is, 
a big number, but still very small compared to the planes and to the automotive as such, particularly uh, automotive, is, uh, com there is a big part that is coming from trucks and a big part from uh, cars. And uh, uh, there, there is already a solution. The solar panel and electrical cars are the solution. It's only a question of time, but uh, uh, there will be a big growth. It's a question of cost, money, but the, the solution is there. For shipping, the solution the solution, it is not there. There are multiple solutions, and these multiple solutions are extremely interesting because some of them are very effective and not also for CO2. First, a lot of people are not giving much importance, for instance, to the silicon paint. Silicon paint can give, particularly now that the paint work is deteriorating, because of non-poisoning uh, paint, can give an, an improvement of up to 10% to the ships. Uh, some uh, very good paint of the last generation. And uh, we have uh, not only uh, painted 80 ships, the cost is quite remarkable because one ship with silicon paint costs about uh, half million euro to, to put that uh, paintwork. But of course it lasts longer than the normal paintwork. And uh, we have done this on about 80 ships. And we had a very significant improvement and they are certified. Actually by Irina, Hugo has left, but he is giving certificates to prove how much improvement we had out of that. Then many of our ships, unfortunately, they have been built with wrong propellers. The propellers, I have changed propellers on existing ships, even newly built. And I had over 20, 25% improvement by studying the best possible propeller to put on. The, and I have changed about 25 ships. We have changed propeller. One of the mistakes is also that normally the vessel is built for, uh, with a propeller that is suitable for the maximum speed, which has nothing to do with the normal speed of the vessel. So the, the propeller is too big. But to meet that maximum speed, the constructor have built with a bigger propeller. And of course, you need a smaller one that can give much better performance on the, the real service speed. That has given improvement sometimes of over 20-25%. Then, of course, a good keel can give a lot. If you make some trials and you spend some money on trying the different keels, the different bulbs, and sometimes the rudder can be a problem. And uh, there is a promalite, a new bulb on front of the rudder that can improve 5-10%. Other improvement we have recently even studied, and I think on a Princess Cruise Line, they have already put some layer of bubbles under the ship that can give an improvement, they say today, 5%. On my new ship, this should be about 7%. So there are several improvements that can be, apart from, of course, scrubbers that are very important to reduce the, the sulfur content and the, uh, other type of uh, emissions. But also people are neglecting the importance of economies of scale and scope, which has been built in the recent past. Uh, you might say or argue that on a ferry that the passengers are uh, transported uh, free if you are only considering the emission for the lorries that you are transporting. So uh, uh, they, they might... They, they, definitely is much better than any other way of transporting the passenger. For instance, for the islands, uh, is much less polluting than any other way of transporting them. So uh, today there are uh, so many multiple solutions, but sometimes you have to put them all together. Recently, we have even experimented because the question is not only w w how much you emit, but uh, the problem, especially for the health of people, is where you emit. And of course, the worst place where you emit is, of course, in the middle of the town, in the ports, 
like you have seen the port of Naples is in front of a very uh, place where there are lots of people and uh, and uh, we are now and we will have on the first two uh, cruise vessels that we have zero emission import which means that we will build we will put on uh, so certain vessels that we are lengthening 70 like uh, the batteries of 70 Tesla cars and these batteries are recharged by the peak of the power and especially when the, the ship is going down from, a, uh, from uh, and uh, uh, the, the, this power that comes is recharged in four hours of navigation. And then when you are in port, you will be for the whole period in port on uh, the battery power. So you have zero emission in port. So th 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 there is a lot of... Uh, Today, of course, th these uh, batteries are not sufficient for... Uh, but we are already studying on uh, the new version of uh, the Superstar class vessel that we want to employ in Finland, that uh, the vessel will be able also to maneuver coming in and outside the port only on electrical um, uh, power. And of course, the, the, the power, even in port, is generated also by solar panel. So again, you see, there is a little bit of everything combined together, but that gives extremely significant improvement. We have made calculation that in Grimaldi, we have saved over 500,000 tons of fuel in the last uh, five years where we opened a special department only for energy saving and uh, emission control. The emission control and energy saving. And of course, this is uh, not something uh, philanthropic. It's also that uh, we are saving 500,000 tons of fuel, which is the equivalent of uh, 250 million euro of expense. And today, to understand how much the owners are obsessed in trying to reduce the emission, it is explained by the fact that uh, the cost of the fuel for a company, for instance, like my group, is two and a half times higher than the 15,000 people working in the company. So the, the, the cost of the people is over 300 million. The cost of the fuel is uh, today 750, 800 million euro. So of course, every drop of fuel that we can save is extremely important. And uh, this of course, whilst it is uh, extremely important and perhaps the most important competitive advantage that we can have also against our competition. Of course, this is uh, very good for society as such. But I am sure that uh, most of the ship owners are uh, thinking very seriously. Even in our association, what I can tell you is that most of the time, if not half of the time that we spend is uh, either is a national, uh, European or uh, the ICS, we spend more than the half of our time on trying to improve on environmental uh, issues. And I think that we are delivering. The proof is that in 2008, the seaborne trade was emitting about 10% more of what we are emitting today, but today the seaborne trade has grown of about 15, 20%. So, I think we are already delivering, and I think we can say, you know, that very much that uh, we are uh, perhaps contributing seriously to the solution of the environmental problem with the seaborne trade. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Dave, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I have a question about nightly enforcement. I noticed reading through in Annex 6 that it leaves discretion to party states. Now, people tell me they expect the US to take a very tough line on this with penalties for violations running to millions of dollars and perhaps even tens of millions of dollars if there's any attempt made to obstruct justice or not to be entirely honest with the US authorities. On the other hand, um, some countries might take a much lighter touch, mightn't they? So 
I suppose, I suppose Frank is the, is the guy to ask in the first instance. Um, how, how tough are you expecting party states to be, Frank? Oh, we got it to work. I mean, uh, yeah, I'll add a supplementary here. I mean, what sort of level of penalty is going to be enough to deter bad behaviour? It's not going to be pocket money, is it? Well, uh, I, I actually can't answer that question because I don't know. But uh, you do raise a very good point. Uh, we did hear a number of speakers through the morning and here in this panel again say how important it is to have universal regulations, and it is. I, if IMO should be the place where global regulations and the one set of regulations is adopted. But implementation and enforcement is another key part of that. And so if you have global regulations, they have to be universally implemented and they have to be consistently enforced. And we're not, obviously not there yet. It's a, a wide disparity. Now, the IMO is working uh, to try to balance that. The, the ultimate goal of the IMO really is to create a level playing field for the industry, and, and obviously we're not there yet, but uh, we have to continue working in that regard. Now, I, I did mention in my uh, earlier uh, answer that there will be, there are guidelines for port state control and they're quite extensive, including guidelines for uh, enforcing the air emission regulations. And they do encourage the use of professional judgment and discretion in the enforcement of the rules. So on January 2nd, will we see a wave of, of very heavy penalties levied? I, I would tend to think not. But I think if we're seeing, uh, you know, ships retaining heavy fuel all on board, and then if there's evidence that they are burning it after, and they don't have a scrubber, I would expect that there would be enforcement action. Mm. What, what about the owners on the panel? What level of penalties do you find a deterrent? Um, sorry, what did you say? Um, as, as ship owners, what sort of levels of penalty do you need to really deter you from bad behaviour? Of course, you're a good guy and, uh, you know, we wouldn't We're misbehave anyway, guys. but uh, what about other ship owners? Well, you know, as was uh, uh, elaborated on the previous panel, the problem that we have as a shipping industry now, which um, I can't imagine any other sector in transportation having, is that we don't know whether the fuels that we're going to put on board in the bulk sector especially, which I mentioned before, you're in the hands of your charter and it's a totally different modus operandi than liner shipping or uh, ferries or any shipping that's regular and where you're visiting the same ports all the time. In our sector, we're going to have to be able to bunker uh, all over the world and right now, as was mentioned previously by Panos, because the specification of this oil has not been settled, and because even the oil refinery representative before said that blended fuels pose a lot of problems, we are in an incredibly, incredulous, as far as I'm concerned, position of what's going to happen after the first and whether you should be penalized. You know, I mean, this is why there's been this submission at the IMO about an experience building phase to. Uh, apply after the 1st of uh, January because we see at this moment, especially in the bulk sector, insurmountable problems of compliance. So the question is here really, um, how come we've ended up with such bad regulation really? You know, I mean, the sulfur issue is an issue that started, if I remember correctly, about 20 years ago maybe, because of acid rain and because of the health hazards for you know, the populations in ports, etc., etc. Now at that time, I think the sulfur content of heavy fuel was something like 5% or whatever it was. And it's been reducing uh, since then anyway without the kind of IMO regulation. But the 0.5% um, limit is a game changer because 
whereas we were used to burning heavy fuel for 20 years and the engines were built to burn it and there's been all this experience and there's been ISO standards put in place, etc., etc. So even though there are some issues of contaminated bunkers in the bulk sector, even today, you know, they, they, they pale into insignificance in the face of what we are seeing now as potential problems. And I, I repeat that it's, it's, it's a really a kind of unprecedented situation where a sector is asked to deal with fuels that it doesn't know what, how they're going to behave and then accept that it should be penalized or, you know, in whatever way um, uh, punished irrespective of the safety issues involved here, which are considerable, uh, because of uh, the fact that it hasn't got the time to really analyze the bunkers on board or they've been put on board by your charterer and you take them in good faith, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's, there's a huge amount of problems here that I don't think um, people realize were going to transpire. And, and let me just say one thing about scrubbers because I know this is something on which the industry even is split. Scrubbers really, as far as I'm concerned, and this is my personal opinion, in the bulk sector, first of all, they're very difficult to make them effective on existing ships. It's okay if you build a ship and you, are, and you ask for a scrub, but it's almost impossible to make them effective on an existing ship. And it's also a bit of a cop-out. I mean, the 0.5% sulfur limit is basically to stop high sulfur fuels from being burnt in vessels or even anywhere for that matter, but especially in the maritime, let's say, sector. So why have we got this window which allows people who, to, to fit them, which is a basically a commercial decision, it's not an environmental decision. And, and this also complicates issues because it pits one ship owner against another one, and it's all because the oil companies haven't got their act together and can't tell us what sort of fuels we're gonna be able to burn come 1st January 20, and whether they're going to be Marpole and Solas, as Pano said, compliant. I think this is incredible that we're in this situation, but that's it. So really, we would uh, not want, we don't want it by any means, or we, I'm saying the Greek shipping community, we don't want by any means to uh, postpone the sulfur cap um, uh, dates. That's out of the question. We are not asking for that. But we want to bring to the attention, and I think we have in the IMO with all the submissions and the MEPC, which is going to discuss them in a few days, we want to bring the, the attention of uh, all the regulators around the world to the fact that really the industry has been let down terribly on this sulfur issue. Well, by, uh, sorry, uh, just, just uh, you know, perhaps th this example will, will suffice. That w wasn't it better to regulate 200 refineries in terms of desulfurization than ask 40,000 ships to do it? By the IMO. Well, uh, but who can do this? You know, the IMO, as, as, as was said, is not there to regulate uh, the refineries. I don't know whether that's absolutely true because Joachim are um, uh, an observer member of IMO. But even in the European Union, which is very kind of environmentally proactive and aggressive, why haven't they got the refiners in Europe uh, along with ourselves and the shipbuilders around the table and say, and why didn't they do this like five years ago? Okay. Does anybody else want to pitch in? Leo, you're nodding. No, I'd rather change <laughs> tack. Okay, change tack. Does anybody else? Otherwise, I would change tack to something completely different. One, one thing. I, I think that... Uh, Whilst now, unfortunately, I agree with John that uh, it perhaps uh, all the constraint has been put on the ship owner. This is not the case for other business. Uh, but now this is done. Now, let's assume that in some part of the world the ship will not find uh, the, 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 the bunker 0 0.5 available despite the long-term planning was done in the previous port. So you are talking about what type of fine. If a ship is in the impossibility to comply, 
I think this is the real question. Define can be decided. I'm sure that uh, uh, perhaps we have to be only careful of what type of fine we give in the beginning because it will be much more difficult or perhaps in some part of the world the, the, the 0 0.5 might not be available. But said this, I think what is ex the, the agreement once that is done and once that this is law need to be policed, this is sure. And uh, needs to, also we know that today there is a lot of uh, controls we have. We have controls from uh, uh, port state, from flag state, from uh, uh, certification society. So it can be easily done and can be easily uh, uh, detected by Coast Guard and so on. We know also there are detectors that can be put on the bridge in the ports everywhere to, to detect if there is. So I think that uh, nobody will be allowed uh, to, to, to not to follow the rules. But the question is, if in the beginning someone is in the impossibility to comply, and if he can prove that he was in the possibility to comply, I think he has to get immunity. I think this is an important uh, thing. Secondly, one thing also that is not good for the shipping sector is that uh, uh, whilst some, I would say, knowledgeable people are saying 100, some others 200, some other 300, some other more, the, the fact that we are going to the betting shop is not really serious, you know. For people who are investing billions of euro in the future, not to know what is happening. I have my own uh, impression, and the impression is that in the beginning it's going to be extremely expensive. But I am also pretty sure that in the long term it might be the other way around, that uh, the 0 0.5, because I, I think that to produce from most of the fuels, the 0 0.5 is not an expensive uh, thing. So, the, unfortunately, the $300, if this is the differential, or 400 whatever, it is a problem of supply and demand. And uh, whilst the burden is on the ship owner, some other people will enjoy the speculation on uh, the supply and demand issue because they will not be sufficient, perhaps. Uh, and I think if even all, in all the time that is left, if most of the ship owners also want to go for uh, uh, scrubbers, only 3,000 ships can be scrubbed before the D-Day, only 3,000, and these 3,000 are out of 70,000 ships that might be affected by this. Uh, so we are talking of very... So what also concerns me is the logistic of the heavy fuel. If only 3,000 vessels out of the 70,000 uh, ships will consume the heavy fuel with the scrubber. The logistic and the distribution of this fuel is going to be very complicated because it's only a small uh, minority of the vessels. Whilst, uh, I think you were making the point, in the beginning there will be a lot available, the supply and demand gain will be won on the heavy fuel but perhaps the logistic in the future, particularly if not too many ships are going for scrubbers, then it will be the other way around. And I also believe that starting from a good fuel is only 20, 30 dollars that you need to produce the 0 0.5. I mm -hmm. have made certain contracts with some suppliers of 0 0.5 for only a few dollars more than the today, mm -hmm. because there is no request of the 0 0.5. So it could be produced also with a very small margin, provided you start from a good fuel. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. OK, and, and Leo, yeah, you've got something you want to raise. I'm, I'm going to raise something, but you can, you can morph onto that subject that's in your mind. But the question is, 
nuclear. Um, Frederick knows about nuclear because he's been traveling around the Arctic where the Russians use nuclear vessels, um, powered vessels. There, there's a technology that's in existence. It's been existent for half a century. Um, there's nothing sort of impossible about it. Why isn't there a shift to nuclear-powered vessels? Does anybody want to give... Well, Leo, I'll start with you, and then anybody else wants to pitch in on that. My, my understanding is that uh, it's a question of cost and disposal of, obviously, uh, the, the materials, the radioactive materials, and, and on, a, on a worldwide basis, it's an, in, uh, an unbelievably difficult subject. Uh, there was one vessel, I think, uh, apart from the icebreakers, the Savannah, if you recall, which was a test case uh, decades ago, and, and that 56, and that proved to be a, a, a waste of time, really. So um, I don't think that nuclear on the, on the shipping side is a viable option. Okay. Uh, but if I may return to something Mr. Grimaldi said, which was very important, you have to look at the basis of oil products because heavy fuel oil and MGO uh, is, are two of the products. There are other products. But the, they all depend, and, and, and this is well known in the industry, on the basis, which is crude oil. And the, the prospects for crude oil are, are sadly not that bright in terms of price because um, there are many issues involved. Uh, it's what really Saudi Arabia wants to have as a price that it, it can uh, pay for its, um, to reduce its fiscal deficits. And, and of course, uh, the Crown Prince has this very ambitious program, Vision 2030, to transform the Saudi economy. Now that is, is, is going to be quite expensive, if not very expensive. So Saudi Arabia will not like to go back to the experiment it, it um, pursued in 2014-15 uh, to let the price go wherever it has to go by not curtailing production. And it went down, as you remember, to $30 a barrel. Now today, it's eight, over $80. Now the question is, will it stay at 80 or will it go even higher? Um, the indications with Venezuela being uh, in a terrible state, Venezuela has, by the way, people don't know it, even larger reserves than Saudi Arabia. It's very heavy oil, but they are vast reserves. Canada has um, equally uh, large reserves of, of um, uh, tar sands. So there is a lot of oil in the world, but of course it's not what is there, it's what people want to produce, how much. And the Saudis are controlling the valves, and um, they don't seem to be keen on letting the price drop back to where it was. So we're looking at a future, a near future of five to 10 years of maybe oil prices being between 60 and $80, maybe even 100 at times. Now that's the background in which you have the fuel oil problem on, on which you add the low sulfur, the desulfurization costs. So you're looking maybe for, for uh, uh, half a uh, half a percent fuel oil, you're looking at maybe $600 a ton. 550, 600, 650, uh, 700 even under certain scenarios. Now that is very expensive compared with what it is today. So there are deeper problems, not just from the uh, fuel oil side, but the, the basis, which is oil itself. Absolutely. And we're currently in the middle of what looks like uh, another geopolitical fracturing between uh, the US and Saudi Arabia, which could have dramatic implications for the oil industry. Um, does anybody else want to comment on nuclear, or do we all think it's just too expensive, safety problems, not even worth thinking about? Um, and then, John. No, it wasn't about nuclear. I wanted to say something about oil. Right? Okay, sure. Um, Panos, talk about, talk about nuclear briefly, and then we'll go back to John on the Just one. very briefly. I'm sure things have progressed quite a lot since then, so both in, in terms of safety and in terms of cost. So before looking very deeply into it again, I don't think we should uh, sort of uh, throw, it, uh, throw it by the wayside. Um, but I had another question on the question of um, the fossil fuels, and maybe um, you can 
take, uh, you can make a comment. Uh, are we sure that the future supply of the 3.5% sulfur is, is guaranteed to be there? So to pacify all the people who, who are investing their good money in scrubbers, what do you think? It, it depends on how re refiners uh, react to this uh, problem, to this issue. Uh, from what we understand in the Mediterranean, I know from Greek refiners, Hellenic Petroleum, they said that they will keep on producing 3.5% uh, sulfur fuel oil uh, because it's expensive to upgrade. To, you can upgrade fuel oil, but if you're, you're going down to the deepest part of the barrel, it's the most difficult uh, to uh, upgrade and costly, uh, and, and the, the flexi cokers, these very expensive bits of kit, hyd hyd hydro crackers, uh, you know, seven hundred million dollars. So they, they, Hellenic Petroleum installed a few years ago a hydro cracker, but it's a very, a very expensive bit of equipment. Now, it, it comes at a cost. Well, now, if the refiner is already indebted or doesn't want to spend that kind of money, there will be heavy. Uh, sulfur fuel oil, they will exist. And, and if it's not here, you can certainly find it in the Middle East, and there will be traders who will be buying it and providing it um, to, to people who trade in it. So for, by all accounts, it, 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 it will be there, it will exist, and scrubbers, since they're not that widely uh, used so far, have installed, there will be enough for them, I'm sure. Yes, I, I wanted to um, uh, make the distinction between the problems because this panel is about fuels, uh, between the, the challenges faced by the industry on the CO2 issue uh, which, uh, and on the sulfur issue. Now, they both relate to fuel, obviously, but as far as the sulfur issues, I think they're short term. I think Emmanuel Grimaldi said this too, that I believe that, uh, that, that the situation will play out in the next uh, five to seven years. And um, obviously, um, fuel is going to be, I think, more expensive overall, so it means that transportation is going to be more expensive, which might not be a bad thing, because Terry, you mentioned this morning about what are we doing as citizens to reduce our carbon fit, uh, footprint, you know? So it might be good for shipping to increase ton miles, but it's not particularly good for the planet. And ton miles respond to the demand that people have for, you know, um, staples and for goods, etc., etc. And there, as I mentioned this morning, the distinction, as far as I'm concerned, is that shipping deals mainly with staples, which everybody needs around the planet, and uh, other forms of transportation and even part of shipping with liner, etc., etc., are not dealing in essentials necessarily. But I think that the sulfur issues will play out. The CO2 issue, though, which is uh, um, related directly to fossil fuels or carbon intensive fuels, there really, as I said before, I think that this is again a personal opinion, that at some point this business about heavy fuel in the marine um, um, market is creating a two-tier market and an anomaly, which uh, it would be better if it somehow there was a kind of, you know, um, and the date to this, a cutoff date. And this, I don't see how that kind of is going to uh, tally with what uh, Leo said about the existence of so much shale and other types of uh, fossil fuels around the world. I mean, this doesn't augur very well to me about the sort of move away from uh, uh, fossil fuels as far as the shipping industry or any other industry is concerned on the one hand. And secondly, a related problem that I'd like to make, because I think it's very important, is that the breakthrough technologies that we need in shipping, which are not available today, and which are available, for instance, for cars, um, research needs to be made and done. And it's not the shipping company, again, who has to be looked at for this, because especially in the bulk sector, again, our private family businesses do not have the resources to do this. So research into the breakthrough technologies which will take us out of fossil fuels, or if not entirely, at least to a very large extent, need to be organized. And this is another area where I don't see a lot happening in the EU even, where they're very kind of stridently critical of shipping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera.
have a view on this? Do you want to say anything? We're running out of time. Not really. Emmanuel. If I should have a bet, I think I would bet on hydrogen. But uh, of course, we have to see the future. But uh, I think uh, the combination of hydrogen and battery, I think, is the long term future if we want to address the issue. The rest, I think, it's all uh, something that we have uh, in the intermediary period. Uh, but the, the other thing also that is very, very important indeed is that today we are already making huge um, uh, improvements. I remember when I started in my job, a vessel which was able to carry 1,000 cars, was having my first job that I had. I, had, I was looking after a ship that called Dora Riparia. She could carry 1,000 cars from Italy to UK. This vessel had a consumption of 30 tons at, 50, at, uh, 30 tons at 16 uh, knots speed. Today, my new car carriers of 8,000 car capacity, they have the same consumption of 30 tons. So we are carrying. 8,000 cars with the same fuel that was used on uh, 40 years ago on my car car. So this means that uh, today we are eight times more efficient in, uh, in fuel. This is a combination of everything. And the economy of scale is very, very important indeed. Uh, the same applies on Roro ships. We have Roro ships of 1,000 linear meters that I was employing up to five, six years ago, they will have the same emissions of vessel that will be able to carry 7,000 uh, linear meters. So we are talking either vessels of 60 lorries, they had the same emission of vessel that in the future we will receive and they can carry 500 lorries. So I think this is already a tremendous improvement. So I think we should uh, also end with a little bit of optimism. I agree. <laughs> that, we are delivering and things are happening oh, in shipping. Idea. It's not that we are not. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. And what a great note to uh, finish on a very, very optimistic, upbeat picture from a local ship owner. So thank you very much to you and thank you very much to everyone else for, again, sort of participating so fully and so honestly about a really, really tricky subject. So, yeah, thank you.